Well, good morning, all you dear people from here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> so glad you could be with us this, this rainy day in Plainfield. Um, our subject today is reality, and we are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent, Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. And thank you again for joining us. We will begin with our morning prayer. Good morning. This prayer today is sent by Kerry, I believe, to our church, and it is titled A Scientist's Prayer. And it's from January 1887, Christian Science Journal. Infinite Spirit, Supreme and Adorable Intelligence, we revere thee for thou art omnipresent life. We praise thee, for thou art omniscient truth. And we adore thee, for thou art omnipotent love. We thank thee, and rejoice that we can, with the understanding, in spirit and truth, worship thee as our Father and our God. Help us to realize thy nearness to us, even that it is in thee that we live, move, and have our being. And may our knowledge of thee increase till we can, with the confidence that is begotten of the understanding. Take hold of thy great and precious promises, and realize that thou art an ever-present help in every time of need. May each human life be a prayer of good deeds and a continued anthem of praise and thanksgiving, thus giving the divine injunction to pray without ceasing and in all things to give thanks. And may we be abundantly blessed in our efforts to attune our thoughts in accord with thy great and harmonious laws of being. And while our hearts are warmed, with a flame of sacred love from thine own great heart of parental affection. May we be led by thy wisdom into all truth. We ask all in the name of him who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. It's beautiful. Thank you. And that will be in our forthcoming March Liberator. Thank you, Carrie, for sending that to us and finding it, which will, our, which will soon be hot off the press, right? <laughs> as, soon as, the, as soon as the proofers are done, it will be hot off the press. Thank you for all of you who's contributed and work so hard on every issue that comes out. We're very, very grateful. All right, and now our watching point. Watch number 301. Watch lest when you are sick, you ask, oh God, why have you done this to me? Rather, you should ask, oh God, why have I done this to you? There are times when we need a rude awakening from our mental lethargy. Perhaps we have become indifferent to God and to our obligations to him. Perhaps we have put effect ahead of cause in our procession, put matter at the head of it, where only God, spirit, belongs. Perhaps we have been sailing along so smoothly that we have thrown our skipper overboard. Divine guidance is so essential that we must have experiences that convince us that if we let go of it, we are liable to go on the rocks. Once a boy stumbled over a stone as he walked along with uplifted eyes thinking about God. He was thinking about God, but he was not using his guidance since he did not see a pit that lay in his path. Stumbling over the stone so shocked him out of his reverie 
that he was saved a plunge into the pit. When he realized what had happened, he was grateful for the very stone at which he was at first angry. End quote. Thank you. <clears throat> Comments for that. <clears throat> It's a very important one, isn't it? <clears throat> we should be grateful for the wake-up calls <laughs> and not attack the messenger who gives them to us. <laughs> and we truly, we give them to ourselves. And I think it's very important. I've learned to do that. Anything untoward that might happen, you know, to not just accept it, say, oh, well, that's just the way it is. But to ask Father, what is it I need to know? Is there a lesson here? Did I drift away in some way? Um, and, and then you have to really be quiet and still. You can't have preconceived notions as to what you've done. Or you can't be full of, I, I, I've been praying, I've been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been reading, I've been, I've been. No, just zip it, as they say, and, <laughs> and quiet. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I understand, I, I know. <laughs> you know, we get that a lot. I know, I know this, and I know that. Well, thou dost protest too much, as it says. Just zip it. Obviously, you don't know, so please don't keep saying you do, because <laughs> it, it just doesn't ring true. On the other hand, and this is very important as well, you do not get full of self-condemnation. Oh, I just I did something wrong. I'm so sinner. I did whatever. Please, no, that's equally as bad. Or to, if you see someone else struggling with a problem, to think, oh, wow, they must have done something wrong. That's the typical self-righteous Christian scientist. Again, zip it. You think that about somebody else, you're about to fall in a pit. <laughs> you sure are, because you're seeing a false picture and accepting it, and then looking for a reason. So all of this, it, it takes a light hand. Um, it takes a light hand. Mainly it's listening to God. Maybe there's nothing you, you did wrong. Maybe there's absolute that can absolutely be true. You know, someone asked Mrs. Eddy that once and thinking that because they saw someone, I think a drunk was it her in her thought and her fault. And, Mrs. Eddy said, no, not always. So the main thing is, is seek God's guidance and he will direct your path. Oh, I think also, um, I, when I used to say, yeah, I know, really what, I, what was really going on is, yes, I've read it. I've read it sometime, but I, obviously I hadn't applied it understandingly, scientifically, I didn't understandingly, so... In that case, I didn't know. And I think that sometimes um, trips us off up. Most definitely. Reading it, even memorizing it, does not mean you know it. I, we address this, I, I think um, Jeremy addresses this in in the forum this week about... <clears throat> oh, making, you got to make it your own. I was always amazed how practical the science is once you stop looking up. <laughs> and and start, trip, tripping on all those stones. <laughs> start applying it to your everyday life. It's, it's quite amazing how God really is giving us everything we need all the time. So. Yeah. And as the watching point says, you know, divine guidance is not optional. It's essential. And unless you're unless you're obeying God, you, you don't know anything, <laughs> really. Yeah. I mean, what you knew yesterday is fine. For yesterday. For yesterday. But really, does any of us know everything that we need to know about God today? Is there? I mean, is there nothing that some of us, that, that all of us can't still learn? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. And, and, and what is it that would resist the need to be even more uh, obedient, to even be more leaning on God? 
It would be pride, wouldn't it? False sense of self. A false sense of self, the sense of pride that says, well, gee, you know, I've, I've read this. I've, I demonstrated something good yesterday, so leave me alone, right? Well, no. Today is a new day. And God has something new and maybe something different for us today. And it's big with blessing when, exactly. we, when we lean on him. And I, I love the one where it says we have thrown our skipper overboard when things are sailing along so smoothly. Yeah, because that is often it. You've just gotten so, once again, consumed with your life, your job, everything. You pay very little attention to the things of God. You've thrown your skipper overboard when things are going well. So, please, when you're tempted to do that, remember where it puts you. Go ahead, Karen. I think that's, well, not, I don't think, I know. That's why Mrs. Eddie had us, one of the, day, one of the daily duties is alertness to duty. Um, to not, you know, it shall be the duty of every member of this church to defend themselves daily against aggressive mental suggestion and not be made to forget nor to neglect his duty to God, to his leader and to mankind. So that's, when we've done that, whoops. <laughs> well, and she also says, tear or triumph harms, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So was, beware of the triumph that harms. I was thinking Jesus getting baptized, you know, having the dove of the spirit come down and then going into the three temptations right after that. Yes. You know, when something good happens, yes. I'm always like really wary of it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, just to keep your don't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes too, you can um, have a wonderful healing or you call a practitioner and you feel so uplifted and then, oops, um, <laughs> don't let that Put you hey, back to sleep. Yeah, put you or, or to get discouraged or think, oh no, this is just terrible. No, it's just an, a challenge. You just keep going. It's like you've got the math problem. You've got to work out now, but don't give into it or or berate yourself or. But no, keep going. Keep going. One step, even one step, enough for me. Even if it's just one step, you keep going forward. Always be grateful for the challenges that come up. Thank you. That turns era on its head <laughs> and never be sorry for yourself and never be sorry for yourself thank you and that way trials will be proofs of god's care as they're supposed to be so all right subject reality lil you want to read the golden text for us since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. So, thank you. Yeah, just remember that there's just such a good, like the um, story in the lesson this week about... A man of God <clears throat> and his servant not seeing all the good that was right at hand. And Lawrence, you wrote something beautiful concerning that. You want to give that to us now? Like I'm not there. Okay, well, um, come back if you want. Okay, could you? Yes, all right. Okay, um, and it was a beautiful, responsive reading. And Louise spoke to that, uh, passing through the waters, I will be with you. They shall not overflow thee, and they walk us through the fire. And do you all remember what she wrote <clears throat> about the Apostle John on the forum? Hope you all read the forum. I do. I do, but I'm not there. <laughs> okay, well, what, what, well, what happened? In his latter life with John, he was he was put in a huge cauldron, which was prepared and filled with oil, pitch, and resin, which melted over a fire of wood, and an enormous crowd assembled on the spot to see the spectacle. He was put in a pot of oil, hot, 
and they found him, they heard him singing. He was singing, and they tried to make it hotter and hotter. It had no effect on him. When it was all over and everything was burned, he was just sitting there, good as new. So remember, I always think when you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. Don't be afraid of the dark. The end of the storm, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just keep singing. Wasn't there a children's book? Uh, yeah. Cheerio. Cheerio, yeah. Cheerio. He was a little bird that was yeah. found in a... There's a pamphlet called Keep Singing. Yeah, there's a pamphlet called Keep Singing. So keep singing. The darkest times I've found, you get your hymnal out and sing. Shut those nasty thoughts out. Sing at the top of your lungs and tell Era where to go. And don't stop until you feel release and peace. I've done it many times. Singing is a tremendous power. Praises to God. You know, it's a universal, isn't it universal? Everybody everywhere loves to sing. I, I love this video that Benjamin sent me a while ago, Little his little baby boy, Stephen. When he was a little baby boy, he's gotten a little older now, but he was in his crib. He could just stand up, hold in the railing, and his mother was playing music. And Stephen was bopping her around, and his head was bopping around. He was, <laughs> now, don't you know that? Don't you know a child that does that? The earliest age, the minute they hear music, their face lights up, and they're bopping all around to it. It's joyful. It's healing. It's wonderful. And if you can't, if you find that Era is just shouting at you, we'll shout back with a good old hymn. It works. And that's why we sing hymns. In our <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's often, it's been sometimes the most popular thing that's viewed are our hymns. And we've had letters. You know, there was someone I remember in China who just loved our hymns because he was living in China and couldn't hear any hymns. And he played them all the time. Um, sing a hymn, just like Dear John. Faith has said that the, you know, Peter and Faith CDs are popular over there, too. In China, oh, yeah. yeah. And they're very joyous. Yeah. Joy I, keep my, I keep my hymn all right by my bed because when I can't go to sleep, I start singing hymns. Oh. As soon as I finish singing about eight or ten songs, you know, <laughs> right. And I go to sleep. It's wonderful. That is wonderful. And you know, fairly speaking, that healing out of insomnia. Well, that's a good recipe. Sing. Sing. And even if you think you don't know how to sing or you're a lousy singer, anyway, no one no one's li sing as if no one's listening. Isn't I'll that put air off right there? It will put air off right there. <laughs> Vic Nell Young says if anything's true of singing, then we're all singing. Well, yes. And, and remember, there are times in history when everyone is gathered and just sung. There was a, a video I saw a while ago of a, a school, children, children, and a tornado was headed toward their school. And they all got together and sang hymns. And guess what? The tornado went Gosh. the other way. Yes. <laughs> Sing. Well, and really... Hymns are filled with the enduring, the good, and the true. Yes, that's true. And when true. you sing them, they go into your soul. Yeah. More, more so than if you just read them. Yes. When you sing them, God, everybody hears. <laughs> you hear everything. And really, the, think, think about this golden text. There's a divine principle here that is... Radical, really radical. Does anybody want to do, want to put into English, modern English, into scientific English, what what this principle is? <laughs> don't don't, <laughs> don't expect to perceive reality 
with your eyes or with your ears. What you see and what you hear is not necessarily going to show you what is real. Only you, all knowing God can show only, you. Only exactly. Only your spiritual sense will guide you as to what is real. And so that's the lead in to Florence. This <laughs> is the yeah, second Kings where Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So I said that uh, we should all be praying this prayer for ourselves and our world so that we may reflect the divine vision, which alone can reveal to us your truth, God's truth, which alone is real. Like the young man with Elisha, many are gripped with so much fear of one thing or other. Blinded by the foolishness of human opinion, we deal treacherously with each other. Swayed by the lies of mortal sense, we are influenced by hatred, selfishness, injustice, greed, and so on. Mesmerized by animal magnetism, we accept the suggestions, temptations of sin, sickness, and death. We are all praying this, that we may be imbued with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith meekness, temperance, to gain the vision clear that we may see your present power, glory, and light to lead us out of this bondage of false sense. Lord, open our eyes that we may see. That's it. That is just beautiful. It's perfect. And that will be an article for the Liberator. That's just beautiful. I know you put it in the forum, but it should be in the Liberator too. The way you worded that, mm -hmm. the way Air is trying to mesmerize so that we don't see and get us fighting with each other turning on each other it's all just one big fat lie it's not the truth and that beautiful hymn you mentioned probably years ago now be thou my vision O lord of my heart i think of that all the time be thou my vision O lord of my heart let me see as as thou seest father and that is the prayer that opens our spiritual sense, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Is that in our hymnal? It isn't. No, it isn't. And they were they were going to sing it today, but since it was Palm Sunday, they're singing Jerusalem. But another time we'll sing it. It is on it. our website. It is on our website. Yeah. From it's a beautiful. Time. Beautiful. Yes. Another time, our our little. I call it the Plainfield Trio as of late. Yeah. <laughs> the Plainfield Trio sang it, I think, right? So There's an article I always, I don't remember the name of the article, but it, and I always use it uh, for my eyes. It says, so it ever be, so it is with sight. It is purely mental. It is, yes. Purely mental. It's not about your eyeballs. And the more we know this, the more we trust God for our everything, everything, our hearing, our sight, everything. If he is the source of it all, the better off we'll all be. We won't get into this human mind traps of this is wrong and that's wrong. I'd like so to remember that Mrs. Eddy tells us that our faculties are in mind. And if in mind, what can change it, right? perfectly um, it, they are all in their perfect state thank you because so it is with our very being isn't it yes. with every, everything about us is spiritual mm -hmm. right we go back to the scientific statement of being it's a statement of scientific fact it's not an option yeah it's the truth of it's your the, being I think you can prove that by, uh, I have vision issues I'm working through, by just, uh, if you, you can close your eyes and, and you can see the things that are around you in practice and little, in little steps. 
use that at night. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I go back to, <clears throat> this was a story, it was Donna from Oregon told me once she saw it on Channel 13, I think. You know, these people with, it's just an example of um, people with uh, multiple personality disorders. I've told some of you this. Well, when one person was Alice, she had perfect sight. And when the same person would become um, Mildred. Mildred. Yeah, when she became Mildred, she could barely see. Mm -hmm. And when the doctors examined her eyes when she was Alice, yes, she had 20-20 vision. Then when she became Mildred, well, she had terrible vision, according mm -hmm. to the doctors. So I just bring this out because it is it is what Florence just said. It's mental. How could that be? How could how could her eyes change? It was just a change of thought. And so her eyes seemed to change. So this is true with so many things. Um, probably true with other ways. Probably people in one thinking they're one person, they have a disease, thinking they're somebody else, whoops, the disease is gone. It's proof, more proof, more evidence of what we're saying is so true. So, and in the responsive reading today, fear not for I am with thee, I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth. I always think of this in praying for children. Um, you know, this idea right now with our youth being attacked with drugs you know, and all, all of this other stuff. No, 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 no. God is going to do this. He's going to bring thy seed from the east, gather thee from the west. He's going to bring them back. I'll bring them back. We're not going to let them be lost. I, I think of that. So all our children, all that's coming up, the next generation, in God's hands, they won't be lost. He'll bring them back to us. Can't be lost. And then the last, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. That's something most important to remember. Mm. You were created for his glory. Your children were created for God's glory as well. Not not for your glory. Not but the for other God's way glory. around. Yes, they, <laughs> your children were not created for your glory. And God was not created for your glory <laughs> because that's what people think. God, I want this, that, and the next thing. And you're created so I can be great. <laughs> and that just doesn't work. That's got things a little backwards. <laughs> and to say even if they go into an Ivy League school, it's not for my glory. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That's right. So, I to remember, you, your children, we all were created for his glory. What is his glory? It's not about what you want and you're outlining. Forget about it. Good old Jersey expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to end up saying, oh, God, why have I done this for you? <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. So we'll we'll keep the horse in front of the cart, not the other way around. And um, I just wanted to mention, because this is at the end of the lesson, but Louise in her forum quotes Signs and Health in the lesson that all the real is eternal, perfection underlines, re underlies reality. Without perfection, nothing is wholly real. All things will continue to disappear until perfection appears and reality is reached. And she gives those the definition of perfect, finished, complete, consummate, not defective, having all that is requisite to its nature and kind, fully informed. And he and it also a quote from an uh, article by Helen Wood Bauman. Jesus' acquaintance with his own perfection in God made it possible for him to perceive perfection in others, and the perfect view destroyed the illusion of imperfection. The Father, being perfect love, provides perfection for all. One needs to stop looking for perfection in imperfect matter and to find his real self in spirit. So... Um, I was thinking today about perfection. What do you, when do you see perfection? 
and how do you see perfection? Well, this morning I looked out at my wind out of my window, and in New Jersey, the daffodils are just coming up, and they are perfect. They are just perfect. Hundreds, hundreds of daffodils can all be perfect, right? Just perfect. And I thought, I thought then of this poem that we all love, Trees by Joyce Kilmer. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray, a tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair, upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but what? Only God can make a tree. Only God can bring about perfection in everything. And it is, we rejoice in nature because we do see the perfection of it so often when, when men stay out of the way, people. <laughs> and so it is with ourselves. You cannot possibly humanly be perfect. You cannot. No way. I've tried. Does not work. <laughs> Can't even come close. You just got to let God work. That's what's perfect. Only God. Only God can make a tree. Only God can bring forth perfection. Humanly, we cannot. So whatever you're trying to achieve, humanly, to make perfect, forget about it. Again, <laughs> only God. He's already made it perfect. So We just need the eyes, as we've talked about, the eyes to see. Mm -hmm. So the eyes to see it. <clears throat> now, we have the story about Moses. And um, Linda, you want to comment on what you wrote? Oh, Yes, uh, it's the first time I, I was reading it, and I somehow felt like I had read the words "fear not." And when Moses was talking, I mean, God was talking to Moses, and then I, when I went back again, I realized it was just the it was in the command uh, that He was giving Moses that really it was "fear not," you know, because He was telling Moses to do it, and He wouldn't give Moses something to do and not the ability to do it. So I just I just felt a new sense of when God tells me to do something, he doesn't have to say fear not, just can just put it. forth thine hand. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and then uh, to when he bade him or bid, it meant to invite, command, or order or direct. So when so he followed. And that just was in Mrs. Eddy's writing too that Moses' fear was lessened, she said, when he found out. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that's interesting. Uh, you know, all these words everyone looks up and gives you new meaning and thought about it and yes yeah, you're actually addressing what mrs eddie writes about that which is beautiful in citation for in, in science and health um it's wonderful and um carrie sent me this article called handling the serpent it's from a may 16th 1903 probably journal article and it says, throughout the entire scriptures, the serpent is used as a symbol of all that is wrong in human consciousness. And the command has always been to handle the serpent of deception with the understanding of truth. And finally, it destroys it in all its forms. When we reach that stage in our growth of experience set forth in Revelation, we will not only have handled the serpent of suggestions and deceptions, but we will then be able to see that old dragon, the devil, cast out of our consciousness. This goes back really to what um, Florence wrote, too, because all of these deceptions that we're seeing when the truth is actually there. So then Moses was commanded to handle this serpent and did so. Yet until he handled it, fear ruled him and would have carried him into all forms of error. The serpent unhandled is the fallen state of man, a state where life is believed to be in matter, 
command to be mortal, subject to all the claims of sorrow, sickness, and death. A staff likened unto a reed shaken by the wind. The serpent handled is the understanding of true wisdom, that man in the image and likeness of God is spiritual, and even now is capable of rising above this fallen belief of things. So, I just love that, the idea of this serpent. And then, now, the word handle, because we're always being told to handle, okay? When you get told to handle the belief of sin, disease, and death, to handle the serpent, to handle animal magnetism, handle, to manage, to train or govern, to control, to make tame, to have under command, to make subservient. That's what you do when you handle. If you haven't made the belief subservient, subservient to, you the to the truth, you haven't handled it. And, and where does this all go on? In your consciousness. I think to dominate, instead of being dominated. Yes. To, Thank you. To have dominion. Yes. The God-given dominion over it. Exactly. Thank you. And those are those pages, 390 to 393. And she says that God made man what? Perfect. Capable of this. Capable of this. So don't tell me you don't you can't do it. Because God just told me you could. <laughs> so I won't believe you. <laughs> now you without God can't. are incapable. Yeah. Uh -huh. But with God, in other words, in obedience to God's commands, in obedience to God's laws, you are fully capable. But think about Moses. If he hadn't had the experience of picking up the serpent by the tail and watching it become a rod, a staff that he could lean on, would he have had the dominion over these beliefs? Would he have had sufficient dominion to be able to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? No. He would still be in fear. He would not have been. He would. He would have been subject to their fear, and he would have given up halfway. Yeah. It wouldn't have worked. And so we, in our life experiences, unless we handle the serpents that come to us periodically, usually on a daily basis, on a daily basis, <laughs> <laughs> when, when we handle them, we, we lose the fear that enables us to, to do wonderful things that God has for us to do. But if we don't handle them, we live our life in fear. And we, don't, we, we just don't rise to the occasion to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. And what a shame. But God keeps giving us opportunities. Yeah, you'll have, you'll have another chance so, tomorrow. So, so that tomorrow. <laughs> Later today. <laughs> until we are master of the occasion. <laughs> yes, until we're the master of the occasion. And that on page 393. Mind is master of the corporeal senses. And can conquer sickness, sin, and death. Exercise this God-given authority. Exercise, that means to do it, Right. Get in there. Don't go to the gym. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Do this. It'll help you a lot more than going to the gym. Take possession of your body and govern its feelings and action. Rise in the strength of spirit to resist all that is unlike good. God has made you capable of this, and nothing can vitiate the ability and, a pow and power divinely bestowed on you. No <laughs> excuses. And what does vitiate mean? <clears throat> yes, what does vitiate mean? Take away. Yeah, it means to render as useless. Mm -hmm. Nothing can render what God has given you as useless. There is no power that can take away the power that God has given you. 
So don't let anything take it away from you. One writer writes it this way, that the dominion that we have of God is a light within every one of us, which we can switch on to let that darkness go wherever it belongs, the darkness of the fear and the this and the that. And it's within us. So we have to be conscious of it, that we have the light to switch on. All we need to do is to switch that light on. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a beautiful. Thank you, Florence. <laughs> and even in our darkest moments, when we when we don't feel that light, when we don't feel like the light is anywhere as near us, it is there. There, yeah. <laughs> it is always there. And as Florence said, switch it on for heaven's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> like the church service, it, it turns on the light so often, you know. Mm-hmm. At least it's once a week. You can hear it twice a week. And that is all of us together in unity, knowing these truths and praying these truths. And it's making your own, it your own. And um, Joe wrote something beautiful on the forum, too, about, I love that. It is, it is impossible that man should lose all that is real when God is all and eternally his. So you can't lose anything that God has given you. That includes your health, your joy. Uh, all good things. So what is the only thing we can lose? Sin, disease, and death. Sin, disease, and death. Arriva Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we will usher it out the door quickly. <laughs> but we have to know it and we have to exercise our dominion over it. And that's handling it every day, confronting it. Something that got me through life is this quote. From our beloved Blue Book on page 139. Do we not all understand cowardice never conquers to get rid of temptation of any sort or to get out of a difficulty? We are not passive and let the wrong rule the right, but we struggle and thus conquer. We should not avoid the things that hurt us, but repeat them and meet them as their superior Disease is a coward that leaves when you are not afraid of it. Don't be running from it and scared <laughs> from it. You need it. And nothing can vitiate, vitiate that power bestowed upon you by God Almighty. And that includes every conceivable kind of disease both so-called physical disease and so-called mental disease. Yes, and so-called incurable disease. I love that. There was a beautiful testimony I read. It was from Louise in Missouri. <coughs> Missouri. Um, you know, that something seemed to come back on her, but she kept at it. She wasn't going to accept it. She did all the things that we were just talking about. Um, and it didn't come overnight, but eventually it left. And so it must be for all of us. Um, <clears throat> I think at times, because of the repetition of it, we tend to believe that it's true. But it's been wrong from the beginning. So when it comes again, it's still wrong. It's still a deception. So. Yes. It, it doesn't matter how long it's been around or anything. It doesn't matter. Um it's, does it matter how long a room has been dark once the light comes on? It doesn't say, hey, I've been dark for 50 years. You're not bothering me here. No, <laughs> the light goes on and the darkness goes. And then, you know, what Parthens wrote, and this goes into what Jeremy was saying about making it your own. This guy in World War II, a merchant marine, you want to tell us about it? Oh, yeah, just, you know, it helped him going through Psalm 23. He was a Marine, so he made the Mariner's version of Psalm 23. And Do you have it? Can you read it? Oh, yeah. Um, the Lord is my pilot. I shall not drift. He leadeth me across the dark waters and steereth me in the deep channels. He keepeth my log and guideth me by the star of holiness. For his name's sake. Yea, though I sail amid the thunders and tempests of life, I shall dread no danger, for thou art with me. 
Thy love and thy care, they shelter me. Thou preparest the harbor before me and the homeland of eternity. Thou anointest the waves with oil, and my ship rideth calmly. Surely sunlight and starlight shall favor me all the days of my voyaging, and I will rest in the port of my Lord forever. It's just beautiful. He made that his own. I love that. Surely sunlight and starlight shall what favor my journeying or something voyaging voyaging <laughs> yeah so you know people who don't like the night or the dark or whatever sunlight starlight god is favoring you bringing into your experience all good because he loves you you're his child and he was captain of a ship that was not well armed and that some people thought were sitting ducks for the enemy to easily destroy and he did. He was not. Isn't that, what a beautiful story! I just, you know, Parthens finds these things. <laughs> I just, all of you, this week's this week's forum was really rocking. I thought, a- and then to uh, again, Louise, the beautiful um, story of blind Bartimaeus, blind man, and I loved what she wrote. And this was a um, a quote from Interpreter's Bible, I guess. Here, Jesus pays the ultimate tribute to a person in need. He stopped and gave the whole of his attention, his mind and heart, to a blind beggar. His stopping said clearly, you count. The art of stopping is a high art. We are so prone to be busy in motion. We have a schedule, so we skedaddle from here to there to arrive breathless at the exact moment of the appointment. It is not easy to stop. It takes humility. But this narrative should remind us that it is a necessary prelude to any real work of healing. Jesus never healed anybody on the run. Stopping is a necessary part of any genuine ministry to life. Please, Remember all the rushing people out there to slow down and be in the present moment. That article by Mrs. Eddy, Improve Your Time in Miscellaneous Writings, where she says, rushing around smartly is no proof of accomplishing much. Haste, my grandmother would tell me this, haste makes waste. How many times while you were rushing, some stupid thing happens, <laughs> you end up taking a long time getting out of the mess. And mainly, think of all the lost opportunities while you were skedaddling, I love that word, skedaddling from place to place, all the people you could have blessed if you were in the present moment. It, there's no place for that. And pressure is animal magnetism. If someone's pressuring you, I don't care who, what it is, job, whatever, you slow down. You take your time. It's the stately goings of mind. How many times has that been proven to me? When I haven't rushed, maybe I was a little late, but so was everybody else or whatever. <laughs> it never pays to rush. And think of the healing work that Christ Jesus did that um, show the chosen certainly portrayed his attention to the, to the present now with everyone he healed. He heard their cries for help. He wasn't too busy rushing that he didn't hear. Now, all that we've talked about today is bringing reality into focus. It's bringing what's true into our lives by our vision, by our action, by our standing for the truth by our not submitting, being subversive to error, by not letting it intimidate us, as Craig said, but being its master. This is what brings reality into our life. And reality is God good. And it wipes away all the beliefs of what is untrue. So we'll end today with another article that dear Carrie found for us. 
This is an excerpt from an article entitled The Father Doeth the Works by Emma Hackathorn. From August 1919. On the walls of memory is a picture to which I often turn that I may recall that the Father doeth the works. It is that of a little child who at the close of day has fallen asleep among his toys. While he is sleeping, night comes on, and suddenly he wakens to find the room in darkness. He is afraid. His fear causes him to imagine that there are hideous forms lurking near, ready to spring. And crying aloud, he beats frantically with his little hands to drive away the darkness. When quite beside himself, from fear and effort, his mother comes in with a loving word and turns on the light. And in that instance, the darkness is gone. To his surprise, he sees as he looks about that there is nothing at all to fear in the room. There are only things that he loves, his toys close about his feet, the music daddy plays for him and the pictures that mother has often told him about as he snuggled close in her arms. The coming of the light destroyed his fear and restored his happiness. It is remarkable how quickly the burden of responsibility lifts on looking back at this picture. For at once it is clearly apparent that only the light of divine love destroys the darkness of error that there is nothing at all to do but to let in the light. Just to remember that in him we live and move and have our being in the presence of divine love. Then the phantoms of fear disappear. The glory and power of God stand forth. And in that moment, the work is done. Our effort to do the work of ourselves is just as futile as beating the darkness to destroy it. The light of his presence dispels all gloom. It makes no difference to the light what type of darkness it comes to destroy, whether it be dusk or the blackness of midnight. To the light, it is all the same. Neither does it make any difference to the light whether the darkness has been in the place where it is found for the space of a day or for many long years. Darkness is only the absence of the light, and light always dispels it. Just so it is with our problems. The sunlight of his presence destroys all fear, all gloom, all woe. The one thing and the only thing for us to do is to let in the light. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.